You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What is up? I hope you are doing great and thank you so much for tuning in and checking out my show Straight to Video. Today on the podcast, I welcome actor, presenter, film producer and all-around good dude, Jamie B. Chambers. Now, a few months ago, Jamie reached out to the show to ask if I'd be interested in chatting, so I did a deep dive into what he's done and immediately knew it would be a fun and interesting talk. Now, Jamie was pretty late to the acting game, although being a movie fan all his life. A real chance and unplanned realisation that he was no longer happy doing what he was doing and decided to make a leap of faith into one of the hardest, most competitive industries there is. With no real plan B to fall back on, Jamie has made his dreams come true and his impressive CV contains films like Fury with Brad Pitt, Kingsman The Secret Service and Star Wars The Force Awakens to name but a few. Other than acting, Jamie is obsessed with every aspect of the movie industry and is also a producer working with Razor Edge Films whose current project in the works is titled The Beast and centres on the relationship between Arnold Schwarzenegger and the world's strongest man, Eddie Hall, and how their paths have crossed and influenced each other. We talk all of these in our chat as well as just lots of fun movie talk and 80s and 90s pop culture, so I think you will have fun listening in. Before our chat, as always, show some love and support for the mighty Dead Skull Coffee. If you're after some of the finest ground or full bean coffee with a real rock and roll attitude, then hit these guys up and grab 15% off simply for being a listener to this show. Head on over to deadskullcoffee.co.uk and add the discount code STV on checkout and you are all set. Once you've listened to my chat with Jamie and want to find out more about his career, then you can find him at jamiechambers.co.uk and he's on all the social media platforms. But for now, please enjoy just two blokes talking about films as we get into my straight-to-video chat with Jamie B. Chambers. So how you been? You've been busy the last few weeks. I've been nonstop. It's been insane. I'm doing stunts on a Bollywood film at the moment called Action Hero, which has been so much fun. It's been one of those where like you're sort of pushing your limits a little bit. And uh, we were actually on a boat in the Thames doing a 55 move fight sequence, followed by a chase sequence, followed by guys falling off the back of the boat. It turned out the Thames was too dangerous for what we actually wanted to do, but it's still a ridiculous amount of fun. So that, that was really awesome. And then um, I'm doing a load of VO work and that's taking up a lot of time. Did you plan on doing all kind of voiceover stuff? Because you do like coaching and motivational speaking and all this kind of thing. Was that ever part of the plan originally or is it just opportunities that came along? Honestly, it's strings to bows, a lot of it. My mindset, my sort of general MO is always learn, always be taking new stuff on board and pay it back wherever you can. I am that weirdo on the train in the underground practicing his voices or practicing a conversation between two characters ready for a casting and whoever's sitting next to me gets up walks to the back of the train and it's a great way to have a train carriage all to yourself definitely and then the like i've always coached whether it be sport or combat or anything really and then i mentored a lot in education and higher education sort of like with people who were at the top end and weren't getting enough in terms of their lecturing or their courses so i was doing like elite mentoring and elite education with that on top of that i was also doing some community give back working with the disaffected so yeah it's it's always been sort of intrinsically part of it and then i got approached by mid-atlantic vo to put on a couple of workshops which was insane because you had guys who have done voices on HBO, NBC, Nickelodeon, Disney Plus. And I was like, I can't teach you anything. (laughs) What is the point of me sitting here when you guys are on Disney Plus? But it was awesome because uh, as it turned out, I got a lot of really cool messages from that saying English to American works, but American to English doesn't work. And they picked up tricks from that where they went, okay, now we can start to sort of look at how we can adopt something that isn't Dick Van Dyke, essentially. So yeah, it's been cool. I'm busy by design. I much prefer to have a million things going on, a to-do list 500 pints long. And then with that sort of modus memorandum when I'm going through it and sort of going, yeah, I'm happy to sort of like just be busy. The single life sort of tailors to that as well, which is always helpful. (laughs) 
Tell us what's going off in the background. I can see Michael Keaton, Jack Nicholson. I can see Heath Ledger and I can see Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix, but I can't see Jared Leto. You can't see Jared Leto by design as well. Um, <laughs> so my brother um, a while back made the mistake of getting me Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson and Heath Ledger Batman portraits. I was like, these are cool. I like these. I wonder. And it turns out that the full set was available. I was like, okay, right. Geek mode on. It was one of those where it was like, yeah, I absolutely love anything geek culture like that, especially when it's a little bit out there and it's just nice portrait stuff. And also, you know, place to my OCD of being very square, very straight, <laughs> all in line. But yeah, I've got Ben Affleck, but I went with Joaquin Phoenix because the less we talk about Jared Leto's Joker, the better, I think. Yeah, I think he got dealt a bad card in that deck, though. Yeah, I'm of two minds about it. I think he wanted to throw himself in sort of akin to what Heath Ledger did. But equally, I think a lot of what he did spurned people and actually upset people when it came to the Joker as a character. It was almost borderline pastiche. It was like, okay, I've seen what Mark Hamill's done. I've seen what Heath Ledger did and Jack Nicholson did. I went, I'm just going to go over the top and 11 out of 10 with this. And given the universe they were trying to work in, it just doesn't fit. There's something that's really jarring about it. And I think there's an interview with Will Smith where he says, um, I don't hate anyone, but I hate Jared Leto. And you've got to go some way for the nicest guy in Hollywood to say, I don't like you, you know? So The Batman, have you been to see it yet? Nope, and I know absolutely nothing about it, which is brilliant. I've seen one picture of Colin Farrell in full prosthetics, and I went, yep, yeah, I'm all over this. I like the storyline they're going with, and I think this may actually finally be the best balance of Batman to Bruce Wayne since Michael Keaton. I mean, for me, and we'll talk about 80s movies anyway, but the Michael Keaton Batman is pretty much the ideal and then christian bale and then it's steadily downhill from there the michael keaton one was great because i can remember when the show my age but i can remember when it was announced it's like oh they're getting mr mom to play bruce wayne (laughs) but that was almost the perfect answer for it really well back then obviously they didn't have the internet or twitter forums and reddit and all that sort of stuff and for eighty thousand people to write in to warner brothers and say this is the wrong casting that happened did it i never heard that yeah it's one of the like more um spoken about stories was the because the fandom of batman is so intrinsic like the whole death of robin thing that they had where they had a male in it was kind of akin to that and people were like don't do this to batman i personally think michael keaton played batman with bruce wayne as the mask and batman as the actual character as opposed to you know hiding in the batman costume he's hiding as bruce wayne i don't think any of the other actors that played that character do that christian bale did the billionaire playboy philanthropist thing really well but a little bit too far borderline unlikable but a very good batman and ben affleck very good batman I didn't buy him as Bruce Wayne at all. But yeah, (laughs) hopefully Robert Pattinson can do something with that. No, I think you'll enjoy it, mate. I went to see it last week. You enjoyed it, yeah? I kind of sit on the outskirts of comic book films. Batman 89 is my Batman, always will be. But I went into this one open-minded. I didn't get bored considering how long the film is. It's good. It definitely piqued my interest again and I'd look forward to a next one. So um, I think you'll enjoy it. And he is a great Batman. I think they're going to try and jump on the whole Marvel we're playing with time and universes thing. And essentially, whatever Marvel does really well, DC take it, scrumple it up into a ball and then go, Okay, that's the same. Going back to Suicide Squad, that's why Suicide Squad was a big fuck up because it was DC trying too much. Well, it was DC trying to do Guardians or a similar idea, but without any sort of warrant for those characters or making those characters likable and then no antagonist. The first Suicide Squad, definitely. I mean, the second one, I changed my opinion 100%. I think the second Suicide Squad is brilliant. But the first one, you've got no villain because the villain is self-created. Amanda Waller makes her own problems for herself. And then on top of that, you reduce the Jared Leto Joker to a cameo role that's a side character, more of a side character than he was previously. The second one works really well. I think John Cena and Idris were fantastic. Not so fond of the Margot Robbie captivity thing that didn't really work for me. But in saying that, I'm not a big fan of the Harley Quinn, the way they're doing that. It doesn't fit with like these overpowered supervillain anti-heroes. And then you've got this woman with a baseball bat. Something's not flying there for me. 
but the Starro stuff worked. I never thought we'd see that particular villain on screen. And it's tinged with a lot of melancholy as well. You actually feel sorry for Starro at the end, which is kind of cool. And the fact that Peacemaker is now a TV series, I love that. I don't think John Cena can do wrong. He's very much becoming like Dwayne Johnson in that sense. Everything he touches turns to gold, which is great. Will anybody reach the heights of Jesse Ventura? <laughs> <laughs> No one can reach the heights of Jesse Ventura. No one can be the body. So I want you to take us back to growing up as a kid, mainly in the 90s, those kind of your formative years. I'm guessing like being a big action hero, that was your thing. It's been the thread through my formative years, for sure. You name a Schwarzenegger film, I've got a positive thing to say about it. Do you remember the first one you saw? You know what? I think it was Predator, but it could have been Total Recall. Either way, both were fantastic. So many of my top 20, top 50 films are Schwarzenegger or or 80s action, 90s action related. And I always sort of harken back to the fact that I always wanted to watch action and thriller films. Those were like the quintessential films for me. Rom-coms never held any value to me. And and the same with sort of like dramas and those sort of things. Spy films kind of still got me. I always found Bond a bit of a guilty pleasure. Definitely like your Schwarzeneggers, your Stallones, Bruce Willis, even to a lesser extent, Robocop. It was absolutely fantastic for me. I thought Peter Weller was like, everything you want from an action hero in that time that wasn't a muscle bound guy. So yeah, I mean, my sort of, first foray into watching and enjoying film was like Commando, Predator, Terminator, Total Recall, Last Action Hero. And then you know, on top of that, you've got the Terminator franchise, the Alien franchise, Robocop, and then Indiana Jones as well. Just relentless back then. I say, wouldn't you, if you was getting into Schwarzenegger around Predator or Total Recall, it was like, I go on about getting into bands when there's already a catalogue of stuff there. That's almost like a bonus. You're not waiting two or three years for the next thing to come out. You've just got this whole catalogue just to dive back into especially as this was like vhs times when it was walking down like the aisles at blockbuster and you did judge things by the front cover first and foremost i still have it actually the vhs of terminator 2 and just arnold on a motorbike with a shotgun that's everything an action hero is that's everything you want from an action film on that front cover did you see terminator 2 before terminator Uh, yes i did I absolutely did it the wrong way around and without context as well. But I think because Terminator 1 is a monster in the dark horror more than a sci-fi, there is the sci-fi basis for it, but everything about it is a cyborg Michael Myers, essentially. So if Michael Myers used guns and was an 800 kilo robot. I don't think I've ever heard that term before. I'm sure it must have been used before, unless you've coined it. That's a great term. What, which one's that? It's like a cyborg Michael Myers. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, he is. I mean, the whole thing of the killing of the Sarah Connors one by one, sort of interminably, and just the thing that I harken back to is the nightclub sequence. And you've got a monster quite literally in the dark hunting down your lead character and then the switch at the factory at the end where Michael Bain has already gone. It's just your last girl and your monster left and your iconic phrase at the end. Those sort of things that really stick with you. It's the same with um, the first Alien that very much did the same thing. It was those patterns across those genres and those films. That's what really worked for me. And then uh, obviously Predator came along and changed things. Stunning film. You have to watch it every time it's on telly, Predator. Oh yeah, you can't. I mean, the franchise is hit and miss across the board, but the first two, I would say, are very, very good. So how far down the action hero rabbit hole did you go? Because you had your Stallones, you had your Schwarzeneggers, then you had Bruce Willis came in. Yes. Into Jean-Claude Van Damme. Did you go down the Steven Seagal and Dolph Lundgren? No, no. Lundgren's all right. I don't mind Dolph. He's a bit of a guilty pleasure. Die Hard is amazing. I've got nothing but good things for at least the first three Die Hards. They are a good example of like a good trilogy don't do anymore. 4.0 makes no sense and Die Hard 5 is not a Die Hard film. Whereas the first one set the benchmark. The second one just did the same film again. But the third one, making it across all of New York was awesome and tying it all the way back to the first film. So Bruce Willis sort of became this sort of like weird secondary action hero for me because he he wasn't a Schwarzenegger or a Stallone. That was the appeal though as well. Yeah, exactly. He wasn't your quintessential action hero. He was your Michael Keaton getting the gig. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. The guy from Moonlight, Tim, what's this? (laughs) Well, that's the thing. It was like, you're a comedy actor. And I, I think sometimes those left field castings really do work. 
I mean, Terminator, in terms of the first one, they were still thinking about dubbing Schwarzenegger because they were like, we can sell it on what you look like, but as soon as you open your mouth, we're going to have to get a James Earl Jones or similar in to do the voice because it's not going to sell. We're not going to have this Austrian muscle-bound guy as our cyborg. And then the I'll be back is the most iconic line of the 80s, I would say. And you have to say it in the accent. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'll be back. You know, it's, it's that whole thing of like everyone recognizes that it, it is iconic. I mean, every franchise has those iconic things. I mean, everyone wants to shout yippee ki every now and again. But the other one that I don't really sort of talk about very often, another film you can't really turn off is like Lethal Weapon. I forget it every time I talk about action films. And I don't know why, because they are legitimate out and out action films down to shoot them ups against South African gangsters all the way through to jumping off buildings. I mean, Mel Gibson is incredible. Danny Glover throws it back equally well. Like for me, Lethal Weapon picks up where a lot of the diehard stuff doesn't quite hit home. So you, you got your buddy cop stuff, um, which they didn't get with Die Hard until the third one. But on top of that, you also got a lot of the big set pieces in Lethal Weapon. I mean, one of the best set pieces is all around a toilet in <laughs> Lethal Weapon, <laughs> which nowadays that would be pastiche comedy, whereas, you know, that was the height of tension. But it was such a brilliant scene, everything about it. Yeah. So good. And the Mythbusters tested it and it works. You could survive, which I was like, that's even better. I love that. I was like, that's not even 80s magic. That just would work. So you grew up watching Stallone, Schwarzenegger and stuff, but did Statham become your guy? Because I knew he was like a a big influence on you. Yeah. So um, I was in a very different line of work in a very different career. And I'll be quite open about it. I was bottoming out. And it was one of those things that I, I like to be quite open about when I discuss it, because it gives people a platform if they want to talk about it. But the biggest thing for me was I wasn't going to work that day. I was doing work at like 10 a.m., It was the 20-something of December. I was like, no, no, I'm not getting out of bed. I'm that low at this point. I'm never like that. I stuck on Trial of Sporter 1. And I'm sat there. I'm totally lost in the action and the three rules, even the stuff outside on the first bank heist bit. And he's in this Audi A5 and it's all really delicate. And then it ramps up and ramps up and ramps up. And then we're in the bus garage and it's Jason Statham versus 30 incredible fighters. Then all the motor oil goes across the floor. And there's this like mix of ballet and violence that was just so amazing to watch. And it's this penny drop moment for me where I went, I can do that. I've got no idea how to, and I don't have a skill set to match it, but I can do that. I don't know how yet. It was a clarity moment for sure. It it was one of those where I went, you know what? That's where I'm going. And my sort of basic way of operating is I will do it and I'll get it wrong. And if I get it wrong, at least I've done it because then there's no regret. There's no chance for me to sort of go, oh, what if, or oh, maybe. No, it's there's a more definitive answer than that. So I phoned up work and I was like, yeah, this is my notice. I'm not coming back. And this is like 21st of December. This is a steady job. A path you was on. Yeah. Steady job, steady career, career that I've been in for a decade, maybe longer. And yeah, I made a free profile on an actor website, fully fledged in the idea that I was going to be the next Jason Statham. The idea has progressively developed since then, but that was the kicking off point. And Statham is another one where you kind of fall on two sides of the fence with him a little bit because there's the whole thing of like Jason Statham plays Jason Statham. You know what you're going to get. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's no bad thing. You're kind of hard pushed for a really bad Jason Statham film. The Transporter series is fantastic. It's over the top. It's ridiculous. But then you've got films like The Mechanic, which is absolutely brilliant. And then Hummingbird, Parker, all these sort of films where you sort of go, yeah, I totally believe this right down to Wrath of Man last year. So yeah, I mean, Statham has sort of been a a steady sort of incentive slash inspiration for me. That's sort of married up with the fact that I'm a huge Gary Oldman fan. The thing is, I didn't realize I was a Gary Oldman fan. And the reason I say that is you can watch four or five films with Gary Oldman in it and not even know he's in it. That's the opposite to Statham, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm sort of marrying those two ends of the spectrum up a little bit. In terms of like action films and stuff like that, and in terms of like nostalgia, I go back to The Fifth Element quite a lot. And I forget Gary Oldman is in that film because he has just morphed into this villainous character, but you absolutely love it. That again, I loved Fifth Element because it was sci-fi, it was action, it was over-the-top fantasy. Everything about it was just fun. And you kind of have to look at it with older eyes a lot of the time because you watch it and you're like, I don't get this blue singing thing. Some of these films, and I think Robocop, Starship Troopers, there's a couple of others as well, that were way ahead of their time 
in terms of the story they were trying to get people to get their heads around. I think even iRobot, to a, a lesser extent, they all had this thing of like this, not a dystopia, not a utopia idea. And yeah, Fifth Element sort of hit the nail on the head quite well with that. You kind of have to look at it with older eyes and go, I get that now. I understand this. This is funny. But yeah, so that, that was kind of like my kicking off point And that was the starting point to where I am now. Was it a tough decision to do that? Like from perhaps a financial perspective? Or was it just a leap of faith? Or was it almost like rock bottom? I've got nothing to lose because I'm not in a good space. Both. I didn't realize it at the time, but it's something I'm a big advocate for now is what's going on in your head. Only you kind of get. You can be in the best job in the world, working with the most amazing people and still hit rock bottom. Psychology is not something that is necessarily... It's horses for courses. It's very much a case of it is only for you. It is intrinsically just you. And no one can necessarily, from the outside looking in, tell you, oh, yeah, you're fine. So the first point I had to know, and regret is something I refuse to deal with. Not as in I won't deal with regret, but as in I don't want to have to have regrets in the first place. So that was the first thing for me is, right, find out. As it turns out, the first job I did, I did a drug awareness video for a charity called The Site, which worked with like teenagers and the disaffected, that sort of thing. And I was green as green. I didn't know what a casting was. I didn't know what sides were. I'd never seen a script before. I knew nothing. I'd made a free profile on this website and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We love your look. Can you come in? I was like, all right, yeah, sure. So I rock up to London. They hand me a script from another film. And I was like, all right, cool. Give this a go. Did it and didn't think anything for it. I was like, all right, this is how this industry works. I'm getting an idea. I'm getting blooded. And I get a phone call saying you got the job. I was like, okay. So I'm already sort of like bricking it a little bit. I'm like, oh my God, I've got to act. I don't know the first thing. So I turn up at this flat where they've got like an on-location set. Again, not knowing a single thing about what I was doing, where I was or anything like that. Turn up and they're like, oh, hi, Jamie. This is Jake and you're going to be playing him. I was like, uh, okay, is this how this is normally done? Like totally questioning everything. They said, right, he's going to tell you your, his life story and then you're going to deliver it to camera. And uh, you can cry on cue, right? And I was like, <laughs> what did you put in that free profile? How did you sold yourself? <laughs> well, I clearly oversold myself. Yeah, so I had to like really just run with it and this sort of trial by not just fire but lava and meteor shower and everything else it was like okay cool so this guy tells me this truly harrowing story and i'm quite lucky i've had quite a i wouldn't say sheltered but i wouldn't say brutal upbringing so it was very eye-opening just having this one conversation and then i was sat in this living room looking down the lens which i have since learned that you're not meant to do and um i'm trying to recall all this stuff that this guy has said to me and i was just like oh my god and um i just ran with it and it seemed to go really well and i didn't think another thing of it and then a couple of weeks later this video goes live. They didn't even tell me. And I started getting phone calls from like people from like my past jobs. They're going, um, is it all right if we have a chat? And I was like, yeah, sure. What do you want to talk about? And he's like, oh, we need to talk about your drug problem. I was like, what drug problem are you talking about? I'm teetotal. And they're like, no, no, no. We saw your video. We need to have like a meeting and sort of like discuss your problems. I was like, no, 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 no. I'm acting now. And that for me was like legit, perfect feedback. Okay, run with this. And I did. And I only did like formal training like four years in. When I suddenly realized, oh, you need a toolbox to do this. You really do need to be more au fait with your art form. But yeah, well, that was like the kickoff for it. Did you find you'd learnt things subconsciously from being such a film fan and watching films? If I did, I would have a thick Austrian accent. <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, I know a lot of people who go into acting, they're massive film fans, but there must have been stuff which you could have picked that up from that film or, you know, I mean, there must have been things which you took yeah, on board. More so recently, actually, I've had quite a few leading roles recently and more demanding roles for sure. The film I'm just wrapped on, Morris Men, I found myself in this sort of anti-hero slash action hero role. It was starting to go on, all right, what can I call on? What, what have I done? Where have I been that I can sort of make this work? And I found myself sort of going back to like, even sort of like the first John Wick, even like looking at what Keanu did with that. But then I started going back further and sort of going, all right, I don't want to go full commando with this, but is there like a middle ground? And it is kind of cool because I think something that we've lost, certainly in sort of like the last 10 years, uh, we don't have the one-liners from the heroes anymore or anything like that especially when you look at Arnold commando when he quite literally puts a steel pole through Vernon it's just like oh okay that's where we're going with this and then like let off some steam 
But like most Hollywood things, once those things catch on, it just gets milked to the point where it just becomes, oh my God, I can't, I've had enough of that. It's like, I was a massive Nightmare on Elm Street fan. And like when Freddy Krueger started saying one line, it was the greatest thing ever. But two installments down the line from there, it's like, oh my God, they're really selling this thin nowadays. I think Robert Englund had become so aware of like the comedy aspect that they were going with with Freddy Krueger and to his sort of praise he lent into it and he definitely ran with it a lot more I mean I'll hold my hands up I thought the reboot was better than most of the nightmares I think there's a fine line with the one-liners definitely not the 80s and 90s ones for sure (laughs) you got to work on some pretty big productions early on including Fury and the Kingsman how did they come about the film industry has some sort of dark magic about it and if you don't know where to look then you never find out you need someone who already knows where to look to tell you in the first place and once that happens it sort of like steamrolls a little bit there is a little bit of hush hush about things until it's already happened With Fury, I actually ended up on a boot camp as like a trial. And I didn't really think anything of it at the time. It was more a case of, I'll give this a go. It's military experience. So I'm always interested in sort of broadening my spectrum somewhat. It was also getting beasted by a load of former Marines and squaddies, which is always fun. As it turns out, the sort of skill set that I had sort of lent itself quite well to that. I end up getting involved with the stunt team on Fury pretty early doors. Ben Cook is incredible. He was doubling Brad, Sean Button, Nick McKinless. These guys were absolutely incredible. And be ghosting them a little bit and just sort of like essentially be in their shadow for a lot of it. One of the first things I did on Fury, and it was the most nerve wracking thing. We were doing squib and detonation tests for David Ayer. And we're at Bovinden Airfield in full German costume. And we had squibs put on our chests. Sean had one on his head. And then we had actual full blown detonations going off. So we were about 15, 20 foot away from these huge explosions because we wanted to see what the tank shell explosions would look like. And so- Squibs are like the blood explosions, right? Yes, they're a small explosive you put in your chest and it pops blood out. When I say pop, I mean rip and punch you in the chest. But <laughs> but um, no, it was it was just this amazing like sort of you kind of get swept away in the tide a little bit because you're just going from thing to thing to thing. I turned up at Pinewood one morning because I was doing makeup checks for all the facial scars and all this sort of stuff. So by the end of it, I was in the production department helping getting all the extras running around a huge field in the middle of Oxford that was doubling as a war era Germany. Yeah, Fury was incredible. And I don't like the phrase, but it is kind of true. There is a certain element of right place, right time. And you do sort of count your blessings a little bit. And it is luck of the draw and all these other cliches that you can sort of say when it comes to that. But it was a case of being on the right film at the right time with the right sort of openness to learn and the skill set to do it. And then sort of like, I've been au fait with weapons and that sort of stuff, but I was really open to someone going, here is an M1 carbine. Here's how you do it. Now go over there and fire it. Okay. Yeah, great. And by doing that, I ended up on the back of the tank with a 50 cal machine gun, which (laughs) was another incredible experience. And then um, I got taught how to belt feed a 50 cal in one shot through no fault of my own. I spent 2000 pound in ammunition. The armorer was very happy. (laughs) Kingsman was another one where, again, you sort of hear about production starting and no one knew what Kingsman was going to be or anything like that. Again, another of those left field castings were like Colin Firth as an action hero. I'm not sold on this, but it worked. It worked. Most of the stuff I did was like getting my head blown off and getting shot and running around corners and all this sort of stuff. But it was really good fun. One of the biggest things for me is I try to say yes to as much of the right stuff as I can, because even if it's a smaller part, it's always bigger experience. That for me is always super important. Have you been on set where people are saying, Jamie, that you can go and relax, you can go in a trailer or you can have the day (laughs) off me? No, no, I want to stay here. I want to learn. You know what? Way more often than not. Way more often than not. I was lucky enough to be on Taboo with... Alan Armstrong and Joanna Frogger. It was up in Yorkshire. Amazing, amazing castle location. All legit. Real castle, real hangman's noose, all this sort of stuff. I turn up at the train station and I've been assigned a PA. I was like, you what? This is insane. So I get driven to the hotel and like I drop my bags off and stuff and I come back out. And they were like, oh, no, no, you can stay here. I was like, no, it's cool. You're going back to set because I'll come and chat with people, get an idea of what's going on. I mean, I've done a lot of climbing. I've done a lot of stuff with like ropes and rigging and stuff, but I'd never tied like a slipknot or a hangman's noose before. And that was 
legitimately what my character was doing. So um, I was like, if it's all right, can I come back to set? I mean, it might be a little bit annoying. They were, they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, you can go in your trailer. I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't want the hotel. I don't want to be in my trailer. Like, <laughs> I just want to be on set. So as a rule, I try and be first in, last out. Even if it's like picking up mats or lugging cameras, whatever it might be, I'm always like there for it because um, it's all to do with film. You kind of feel the most energized and the most enthused when you're on a film set and it kind of falls away a little bit whenever you're away from it i mean that's kind of the reason that i produce and i do other stuff behind the scenes that's why i do voiceover motion capture as much stuff as i can in and around film because it's possibly the best addiction you can have so was it through the kingsman that led to star wars the force awakens it was fury fury okay yeah so it was one of the last days of filming on the tank assault and I had a covert in because i had been assigned this squad that had to run at the tank and we, we all had to send people at different times. So I'm sat there in makeup and being bloodied. I've got my covert in and Jamie, can you switch channel? So I switched channel and then how do you deal with the heat? And I was like, are you kidding? It's like minus two out there. <laughs> yeah. I'm not thinking, obviously. You know? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm cool with the heat. He was like, all right, how are you in the heat in armor? I was like, yeah, probably fine. Like these really sort of like odd questions. And I didn't think anything of it. And after Fury wrapped, I get a phone call from a UAE number. I was like, this is going to be the most expensive PPI call ever. And um, it's the second AD from Fury. And it turns out he's second AD on Star Wars force awakens and he's like mate we're out in dubai can you come out and be one of the first new stormtroopers we trust you we know what you can do we know that you're not going to cry about it being 40 degrees in (laughs) in melting temperatures this guy will do anything this guy picks up mats when we tell him he can go and eat this guy's a little bit touched yeah (laughs) and um yes so a couple weeks later i'm on a plane out to dubai with another fantastic guy joe watts who's an incredible stunt performer i've got this picture of like that scene in force awakens where there's all those stormtroopers about to land (laughs) going out on this plane i mean that was another problem with me is i can't sit still so um i actually got to like dress up in a lot of the flight emirates attire because it's a long flight to dubai i was in the back of the cockpit i was serving people drinks i think it's just because i'm incredibly annoying there's pictures of me trying on like the air hostess emirates hat and stuff like this but yeah it, it was just incredible abu dhabi is an incredible place it's beautiful it's clean they've got air conditioned streets And then you go out 20 minutes towards the desert. It's just barren. There's nothing there. The salt flats are literally like another world, probably one of the key reasons. And then over the horizon, you've got this one mile by one mile film set. And it's huge. It's like next level in terms of what I was looking at. And it was all practical for the most part as well, which again, I'm a huge fan of the art of filmmaking as opposed to what you can hide or fix in post or whatever else. And so much of it was practical. And that for me made it that much more immersive as well how long was you out there for you was out there quite a long time weeks and weeks and weeks and john boyega was the big thing for me because i was like i've heard a few stories about this guy who was super enthused to be at pinewood and then was running around the star wars museum and got cast because of this and i was like all right he's a geek like me that's cool and he was so invested in the finn character he did an incredible job And there's a bit where he ends up in the big pig trough thing, drinking water. I mean, he must have done that scene about 15 times. (laughs) But it was amazing. Talk about practical stuff as well. That huge warthog pig thing. It was real. It was there. There's no real CG there apart from to give it a bit more life. That's going like to old school Jabba the Hutt where you had all the puppeteers in it and all that kind of thing. I think it was an eight man puppet. Just incredible. I looked inside, but I was like, that's an oven. I'm not, I'm I'm hot enough in shorts and a t-shirt. And then uh, the marketplace was just bustling. We had so many people as creatures and stuff like that. And everyone was so invested in this new idea because I, I feel like so many people felt shortchanged by episode one two and three it was kind of like an opportunity to reset and go again yeah there's the whole thing of like it is just a new hope again but in saying that it's not terrible it's a great idea to sort of give the franchise over again to a new generation a new generation have their vader they have their luke i loved everything to do with it it was awesome 
sci-fi is kind of hard to get into if you're not necessarily like a full-blown geek to begin with i profess i am a massive geek massive nerd star trek star wars starship troopers anything with star in it last starfighter yes oh, yes my man yep and uh, a little bit of battle star galactica every now and again it's one of those things where like you kind of have to know people that have already watched it because uh a New Hope, it's very different from anything else. If you look like 1970s, there wasn't anything like this, this whole space opera. It could have gone so wrong. <laughs> yeah, massively. I completely agree. It could have gone sideways in a big way. And so many people to adopt that and run with it. And the fact that it has been so amazingly retrofitted by George Lucas over 30, 40 years. And it almost feels like it's a storyline always in flux. There's always something that's going to be retconned or changed. And I don't care what anyone says, Han Solo shot first. Kind of want that in your anti-hero anyway. Even down to the lightsabers, again, something incredibly new and different. I always sort of think about Alec Guinness. He said, I will only do this if you make sure that my character is killed off. It's like, oh, wow, like you you had no faith in this at all. <laughs> and that's why I'm sort of like really buzzed for like you and McGregor to do Obi-Wan because I think that would do that character a lot of justice. That's what I'm putting my faith in. I think there's been an overload of Star Wars the past few years, but I'm thinking if you and McGregor signed on to this, he's either got some big debts like Bruce Willis or he's been presented a very good story. <laughs> I think he just genuinely loves that character. And so few of the prequel trilogy characters had any longevity to them. You look at Liam Neeson and Qui-Gon, there was no longevity to that character. I think they were going to bring him back as a force ghost in the second one or something along those lines, but that never materialised. Ray Park definitely got shortchanged as Darth Maul. There are very few characters apart from like Palpatine that really have any longevity at all. Samura Morrison has come out of it in a big way, which I think is awesome. And the fact that he is actually Boba Fett now is incredible. That's one of the retro fittings that I kind of like. The fact that we've got the Django Fett character and you've got a thread line through, you see Boba Fett pick up the armor. And now we've got Tamura Morrison as Boba Fett, which is awesome. So, yeah, I kind of feel like you and McGregor's gone. Let's do this character justice. When did you see The Force Awakens? Was you invited to any kind of premiere party or was it ticket to the local cinema? You know what? I am rubbish with rap parties, premieres, red carpet. It's not my thing. I'm being coerced into the Morris Men premiere at the moment. Basically, they're just going to put like a layer of protein shakes and protein bars down for me. <laughs> no, I uh, I was actually away filming, actually, and I missed everything to do with the premiere and all that sort of stuff. But um, we actually did a rap party out in Abu Dhabi, funny enough. But I paid for like 20 tickets to take family, friends, everyone. I was like, no, you need to see this. I'm a bit of a cinema snob as well. Like, I don't understand, and it bugs me to this day, why cinemas have the loudest food. It's a test. I don't understand. In an audio-visual medium, we've decided nachos, popcorn, and the hardest to open packages of like sweets, that's what we're going to have. Just to hear that rattle as everything drops on the floor and rolls down. <laughs> Well, the, the worst thing is like, all right, you've got the person next to you who's trying to very gently, very quietly open up their packet of M&Ms. It's like, just do it once. Just get it over with because <laughs> you're going to be rattling my ear. I didn't watch a single trailer, one bit of spoil for anything to do with Endgame. Like not a thing. I knew nothing. I went into the cinema alone. It was like a nine o'clock show. And I was like, I don't want to hear, see or do. I just want two and a half hours. Just watch this. And there was a guy to my left that had um, a smartwatch that was going off every two minutes. So I had this light in my face. Someone was eating nachos next to me. Someone dropped popcorn down my seat. I was like, I can't immerse in this. At one point, I had my hood up. I was like ignoring everyone. I kind of like the idea of just a cinema for cinema's sake, as opposed to all the bells and whistles that come with it. What was your local cinema when you was growing up? Did you have a regular one? Was it multiplex or just like a, a single screener? I had an underground Odeon, which was a bit of a novelty. In Uxbridge, they had a three screen Odeon, which was kind of big for stuff back then. It's now my gym, funny enough. Right. I was going to say, is it now Weatherspoons? <laughs> Yeah, like a, an Irish bar. It was always one of those things where it's like, it was cool to go there. It was it was like a fun experience. And you kind of only get that now with every man, I think. Like the whole bespoke cinema thing. The rest are all very much the same of the same. Like Cineworld and 
showcase. They all very much, it's all the same thing, just with a different logo. One of my earliest experiences of the cinema was um, trying to get into the first Resident Evil. What rating? What was that, an 18? Yeah, I, and I was 14. Me and my 13-year-old brother. Is that the most terrifying thing ever? You know what? What was more terrifying is trying to get past the guy with the ticket thing. Because that was back in the day where you handed the ticket over, they ripped him in half, all this stuff, not just show your phone. The scariest part was actually getting past that guy. I mean, I don't look 18 now, so I don't know how I looked 18 then. I certainly don't sound 18 now. Sat in there terrified. Did you actually get in though? We got in for the first 30 minutes before we got booted out. Like we got up to the terror dogs. I'm not huge on horror. I enjoy the odd guilty pleasure, but I think horror as a whole has slipped very much towards gore. We had the high times of Scream, Halloween, Nightmare. I think at around Saw 3, horror became torture porn and gore. And then every horror film had to have that aesthetic to it. And that really sort of like tainted the horror franchise for me. I mean, one of the best horror films I ever watched was uh, 13 Ghosts. And I look back and it's absolute garbage. I tried to rewatch that a while ago. And I was like, why was this so scary? And it's the one scene where the little boy has got the glasses on and he's looking down the staircase. And you know that there's the juggernaut and the witch. But you can only hear them. You can't see them. And that was the one bit. And I think it harkened back to Aliens. It's the scene with the gun turrets. You see so little going on apart from a laptop screen and numbers going down left to right. You hear all the xenomorphs screaming and explosions, but you see so little. And that's genuine horror. That's the terror side of horror. And somewhere down the line, I mean, even if you look at Prometheus now, they're action films. They're not horror films. The Alien franchise lost its horror thing at about the end of Alien 3. It stopped being like horror. But yeah, going into that first one and like Inside Out Dogs, because I look back now and I love what they did for it because the VFX stuff is now like on YouTube. You can just watch it. And they covered the dogs in honey. That's what the makeup was. Like, it wasn't like ridiculous prosthetic. It was like red colored honey that they dripped along these Rottweilers. And the biggest problem they had was the dogs licking themselves clean. (laughs) There's no secrets anymore. You can find out everything. That's both a blessing and a curse a lot of the time. Some things you do kind of just want to be cinema magic. Has that spoiled it for you working in the film and TV industry? Has it made you a bigger fan of cinema or do you appreciate things in a different way? Let's put it this way. It hasn't spoiled it for me. It has spoiled it for anyone who wants to watch anything with me. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Because I'm such a geek. I love understanding how things work, what's going on to the left of camera and all this sort of stuff. I can't shut up. I took my ex-girlfriend to No Time to Die and I knew nothing about it. I knew not a thing. And it's the bit in the forest where Bond pulls the cable across to a tree and he whistles. Then the guy on the motorbike comes racing across and then he hits the cable. And I was like, oh yeah, this is what I did. I was was like, oh my God, sharp. I said it to myself. It comes from a good place. It's pure love for cinema. Excitement bubbling over. And it is that whole thing of like, because you've seen it and it's palpable and it's real and you can digest it and you can break it down. You sort of can go, oh, I know how they did that. But sometimes you do want to just go, Jamie, shut up, man. I love how you're so excited about all different aspects of film, but you also work in the production side of the industry as well. And you've been working part of Razor Edge Films and you're putting together a film, The Beast, about the world's strongest man, Eddie All, and his relationship and influence of Arnold Schwarzenegger on his life, which is kind of a bit of a parallel, but down two separate avenues. Like uh, Schwarzenegger influenced you as well. But how did all that come about? So I had a slate of films because I was like, right, I'm getting into production. I need to understand production. I'm lucky to have a plethora of people around me that are very talented. Guys like Bo Fowler, Jeff Littlefield, guys who have got great talent and are putting together fantastic projects. And then I met Winston, geez, over four years ago now. And I'm It was one of those one-off meetings where you're like, you run in the same circles, but you don't really know each other, that sort of thing. And we got on so well. Our second meeting was in a gym, bench pressing 120 kilos, talking about film slates. Yeah, it's gone from strength to strength. He's been sort of like taking me through a lot of the intricacies because he's done an incredible amount of work. So I've been very lucky to be working with him on that. And then we turn up at this meeting in London. We are offered this project to sort of take on as lead producers. Eddie Hall was on the phone and he sort of videoed in and we're like, okay, cool, right. And then they're like, oh yeah, well, Arnold Schwarzenegger and a grenade went off and it was just white noise. I was like, I'd forget the next sort of five minutes of conversation. I was very clear 
in what the vision for the film was going to be, even though I was being offered the project. So me and Winston sort of sat back a little bit and we just sort of listened. And then I sort of whispered to Winston, I know where to take this. The biggest thing for me was the parallels, first and foremost, between sport performers that have gone into entertainment. Arnold was kind of the trailblazer for that. There were a couple before, but in terms of iconic and moving forward, he sort of laid the foundations and then people have sort of built on it. You've only got to look at Jesse Ventura and Carl Weathers in Predator, for example. Then on top of that, as things go down, like John claude Van Damme, Jackie Chan obviously was much earlier because he was doing all the stuff with kickboxing and then going into film in Hong Kong. And then you sort of, your mind starts to open up to it and you start going, well, okay, you've, you've also got Chuck Norris, you've got Jason Statham, Vinnie Jones, Ronda Rousey. And then the two biggest ones most recently, you've got John Cena and Dwayne Johnson and you sort of go right there's got to be a reason here there's a parallel between elite sports performance and going into film because I'll hold my hands up I thought Vinnie Jones was kind of a novelty from sort of going from this hard nut Wimbledon footballer Welsh international and it's like you're not a cockney you're from Wales yeah I mean that whole sort of bullet tooth Tony thing you sort of go all right okay that's cool that's fun then you start digging a little bit deeper and you sort of realize the guys you've watched in these action films are former sports stars and wrestlers seem to be like the big thing at the moment you You've only got to look at Triple H in Blade, Mr. Kennedy in The Marine, The Miz is now doing it. One after the other, you've got sports performers becoming actors or actresses. And so we started drawing parallels. Is it a case of if you're the elite in something, you directly translate across and you can just go and be the elite in something else? Or is there a learning curve? Is there a downward spiral? Is there a huge amount of risk involved? So that's what we're exploring with that. On top of that, something that's quite close to my heart and a few people around me is the mental health side of it. Is there a challenge and is there an intricate psychological challenge of moving career, of that transition period? I mean, the risk is inherent because you're giving up everything you know, everything you've trained for, everything you worked your life for and going somewhere else. And this was big for Eddie. But that's surely something you can relate to as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I did the, there is no plan B because plan B distracts from plan A. I'm sure that's a Will Smith song. For me, it was like all in, there can't be any other thing. And I was looking at Eddie and going, you are the world's strongest man. No one is ever going to take that away from you. You've got an incredible story to tell. He's a down-to-earth, absolutely wonderful guy. You kind of want to see what makes him tick, what makes that sort of go, okay, right now, the hardest industry in the world, where it's everyone's second job, everyone has an opinion, and whether you're right, wrong, good, bad, talented, untalented, everyone's going to have an opinion. All eyes on you. Yes, because we only had to look at Arnold and look at um, Hercules in New York and go, okay, no one believes in you in the slightest. Everyone, to a greater or lesser extent, laughed at you because of your Austrian accent and you were just this huge mountain of a man. Then Conan happens and people start going, okay. And then Terminator. The rest is just iconic after iconic after iconic governor of California. And yeah, I think what we try to do at Razor Edge anyway is to have compelling films that have a social message. We aren't just making films for film's sake. There has to be a reason behind what we're making. Otherwise, any production company can just go and make a film. We want to have a a social thread going through everything that we're putting together. And the mental health aspect of this is huge because it is something for the world's strongest man to open up and say, I struggled. I had this to deal with because whether you're into strong man or not, whether you're into lifting heavy weights or not, that sort of thing where you are the elite, you are the best at something and then saying, I still struggle. I still have demons. I still have these problems. That's what people want to know because it gives someone a platform. It gives someone the platform to go and say, you know what? I'll hold my hand up. I've got some problems. I'd like to talk about it. I'm a huge advocate now of people talking about that and giving that platform for people to have that discussion. And so that's what we're trying to do with Razor Edge and definitely with The Beast because there will be a social message that goes with the release of the film where we actually say, look, it's stronger for you to talk about it than it is for you to keep it to yourself. And that, that's sort of really important. What's the current situation with that? Is it pretty much closing on completion or is there still a lot of work to be done on it? We are at a position now where what's happening is the Eddie Hall versus Hathor Bjornsson fight, which is slated as the heaviest fight in boxing. That's going to be incredible. And that has to be built into the story now. That has to be part of it. So there are different aspects to that because of the rivalry between the two men. On top of that, we've got some other things that we want to explore so that we don't make this just men's mental health. We make this mental health. 
to leave it to one gender would be a failing on our part. It needs to be a, an open thing for everyone to discuss. So we've got a few key scenes that we need to shoot and capture. Luckily, all the recreations and drama stuff that we wanted to do, we have Eddie Hall as the T-800 in a bar in Stoke, beating up a load of stunt guys, which was incredible to film. And we did it beat for beat with the original as well. So I'm pretty sure we won't get bad to the bone because that'll cost us a few million quid. But um, yeah, even down to the motorbike and the shotgun, we got it all. So that's going to be an iconic thing. And Eddie was amazing with the performance as well. That sort of T-800 Terminator 2 scene is next level anyway. Did you and Eddie go off on like Arnold Schwarzenegger trivia and <laughs> favourite films at any point? I wish we had time. Eddie is again an incredibly busy guy so when he wasn't working he was working you know but yeah I mean it didn't matter who we were talking to uh, we got 14 minutes and 59 seconds with Arnold in the NEC in Birmingham because Arnold cost a million an hour he is the world's busiest man potentially the world's most expensive man but no he, he was so humble so open the questions that we wanted to know the answers to were the stuff like why Eddie why when Eddie was lifting why did that draw you there and we got some great answers and some great material. And it really sort of showed the belief that Arnold has in Eddie as well, which is another amazing aspect of it, that these two sort of legitimate giants, the levels of respect that they have for each other, which is amazing to see. Just to kind of bring things in closing, I'm going to send you back to Uxbridge in like, let's say, I don't know, 1993, and you've got maybe six quid in your pocket and you get to rent out three VHSs, but they've all got to be 80s action films. Which three would you choose? Six quid. I think there was about £2.50 a night. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the three, it's going to have to be Aliens for sure, Terminator 2, and oh, 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 Predator, Predator. Arnold gets two yeah, out of three. It has three. to be. It has to be. Arnold does get two out of three. Honorable mentions to Lethal Weapon 2 and Beverly Hills Cop, you know? Beverly Hills Cops are overlooked, I think. So much. Axel Foley is incredible. But Lethal Weapon 2 gets bonus points because you got Patsy Kensit's boobs in it for a 15 rated film. <laughs> I mean, who's going to turn that down? <laughs> Mate, Jamie, thanks ever so much. I appreciate you spending some time with us. No, Rob, thank you. It's awesome. Sweet, man. Well, I'm stoked everything's going great for you. Thanks for all the stories. It's been a blast and you look after yourself. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Likewise, buddy. Talk to you later. Great fun to hook up with Jamie B. Chambers here on the Straight to Video podcast. I had a blast hearing about how his career has taken shape, but also just loving our passionate ears and still so excited about films with an obvious love for a lot of the same things I like, and I'm sure you do too. Keep an eye out for Jamie now you've been introduced, or you can follow him all over social media or find him at jamiechambers.co.uk. And if you want to play catch up on 170 episodes of this show, then they can be found wherever you listen to podcasts or dive into stvpod.com where they live with some fun straight to video music, videos and merchandise. And be sure to check back every Tuesday and Friday when a new episode lands. But till we chat again, look after yourselves, guys, and speak real soon. <laughs>